Okay, any questions about anything? There were three questions that I gave you points for that I went back and looked at the uh, uh, the questions and they're just I, I didn't do a good job of giving you the information. Uh, so those three, I'll add those nine points in when I finish grading the second take home and I have to download everything and add the points in for the people that did it in different ways. So I'll do all that. Usually I do that on Sunday mornings. So, uh, so give me till next uh, Sunday. I'm going to be sending out a poll probably pretty soon about the exam and uh, You'll be able to pick for some times uh, for that. And then that will, once we know the date of the exam, then you'll know, we'll know more or less when you'll have your next two uh, quizzes. The final, the fourth exam is not cumulative. It is during the final time, and there will not be a uh, essay or take-home portion on it. So it'll be multiple choice. So it can be graded really quick. Hey, any questions about anything? Okay, today we're going to finish up on metabolism. And uh, I've not put anything up for Wednesday's lecture yet. I'm not sure which section I'm going to cover next, but I'll have those up. And some of you, when you, when you, uh, I sent out that link to that uh, survey said that uh, could I send the lectures out just by email or whatever? And I can do that too. I'll do it as the PowerPoints or as the PDFs. You know, you can. I put the PowerPoints up because some people like to do two per page, or they like to take the PowerPoint. You, you know, if you use OneNote, you can put the PowerPoint directly into OneNote, and you can write all over it if you like. You can write, write anywhere on the screen. Um, I just don't want to put it up. I'm, I'm not going to take my time to put it up in every possible format. So if I put the PowerPoint up, then uh, you can do what you want to with it. Okay. So let's let's finish up with uh, regular metabolism, and then start with secondary metabolism. And secondary metabolism is uh, everything basically. Uh, and want to finish up with carbon skeletons and once again show you what we have right here is uh, well here we have the uh, glycolysis so here we have starch in the chloroplast and this is in the cytoplasm then we have the um, TCA cycle or citric acid cycle, whatever it's been called this year, and this is in the mitochondria. So from that acetyl-CoA through here is in the mitochondria. And from these energy producing pathways, so we get burning a glucose through TCA and remember electron transport, we get about 36, 38 ATPs. then these pathways also produce the greatest majority, most if not all, of everything else that a plant has to build, which is everything. So uh, there are no like, well, you know, we have some things that we have to consume that we don't make. Uh, but plants make every organic molecule that they need. The only thing that a plant needs from external sources is, of course, a tremendous amount of water, a tremendous amount of CO2, and then minerals, either macro or micronutrients. That's it. There are some plants, of course, that can take other things in, but for the most part, we're talking about producing everything from these different pathways. Okay? Now today we're going to flip down to toward the end of your book, and I'm going to be jumping back and forth through the book here. And we're talking about something called secondary metabolism. 
and uh, we're going to be talking about several classes of molecules or compounds of mo uh, kinds of molecules and there is this difference between primary and secondary metabolism. It's a little bit artificial. We talk about primary metabolism being sort of like the central pathways that primarily are used uh, that are in a lot of ways unique, not just uni not really unique to plants, but that are there to produce energy, to produce carbon. And then um, once those needs are met, then the plant starts producing other things, uh, protectorant molecules. A lot of stuff we're going to talk about today are things that protect fruit from being chewed on by predators. And um, more or less, it's, it's uh, when they're not necessarily, they're not essential for cell function, they could very well be essential for the plant survival. So we divide up sort of artificially this energy production system. And from starch, I'm talking about from photosynthesis down to where the CO2 is burned from basically the production of these other things. And you certainly could say that cellulose is really not a secondary metabolite. Um, and this is also the most hyped plant research in the world. You know, every time you pick up something, if you, if you eat a plant that's high in whatever, it's going to do something positive for you. Um, and most of this stuff is very, very tenuous, to say the least. So we'll be talking about some of those, but mainly what we're going to be talking about are these, these compounds that plants make, alkaloids, phenols, um, these different classes that are pretty important to plant survival. And they have very specific functions in plants. Well, the first ones we're going to talk about are terpenes, just in general terpenes. Let me flip back here. The terpenoids uh, are very important classes of compounds. If we look at some of them, some of these are very important carotenoids, gibberellin, steroids, sterols rather, uh, sterol derivatives, uh, latex, essential oils. Uh, so also, some of these molecules are classified as terpenes and then somewhere else they might be classified as something else because it's a general classification. And uh, look at the first one we'll talk about are essential oils. These are fairly simple. Uh, these you know what limonene is. It, it actually is this very simple, this fairly simple molecule that uh, impart some flavor or some odor. Now what's the purpose of, well, I keep popping up. So what's the purpose of this compound in, let's say, citrus or lemons? Yeah, but why would a plant want to smell like a lemon? Attract pollinators and at the same, or maybe keep something from munching on it. Uh, in each of these compounds, by the way, you can find uh, a tremendous set of what I'll call testimonial pages. It's, we've got the internet now. You can find anything, and you can find out why menthol will keep you from getting whatever, and why menthol is good, why menthol is bad. And in all, most cases, you can track this stuff back to some one or two published papers that are not what you'd call great papers, but when you read this stuff, just you know, take that into account. Uh, a menthol is another very simple one, something you can actually smell, of course, very easily. Uh, does mint grow around here? I don't have any growing. Does it grow pretty? You know, mint grows great, great if you have like a leaky water faucet. I mean, it just I, that's in my in my home, my parents' home, there's mint everywhere. Uh, because it's so wet there. 
And um, these things are often found in very specialized structures called gland cells. And there are different kinds of these, and this is what you see when you see those nice videos where someone is uh, squeezing a, a lemon peel or whatever, and you see the little things you know, burst out into the atmosphere if it's a really nice movie or a picture. You're seeing these cells, and these cells don't always have to be epidermal. They can be located um, in, the, in, in the plant, but for the most part, they're up here because this might be the first place that something munches on it so they can extend out of the cell, and they can provide just a little bit of protection, maybe. There are, actually there are actually in plants compounds that are almost steroids. And I've, and these are, and I think I'm going to go over these, I'll go over these, I'll talk about the bodybuilders here in a second, but um, a lot of these plants, a lot of these things are being exploited for different reasons. If you look at these, if you squint your eyes and look at them, they look a lot like maybe a steroid or um, cholesterol or something. And there's all sorts of, again, testimonial data backed up by very little science that these things are great to eat because they compete with cholesterol and so your cholesterol level will go down if you consume plants that have a lot of these in them. They do have some functions. Uh, these compounds can actually emulate uh, plant molting hormones um, so they will actually protect the plant uh, they are also for these OTC supplements. So um, I'm, I've actually worked and have and worked uh, with a company in town that produces um, high-end supplements for bodybuilders. And the thing to do is, if you use something from a plant, you don't have to go through all the hoops. You don't have to register it as a drug. So the thing to do is to find a plant that has something that's a precursor, let's say an antibiotic steroid, so that if you eat that, then your body would turn that into an antibiotic steroid, or as close as you, or as close as you can do that. And so there's a tremendous amount of research uh, going into these, uh, these compounds, and these people spend a lot of their time tracking down papers of different compounds from different plants from different locations. And actually what they wanted me to help them with is they're bringing all these things in from China. And they don't really know if what they're paying for is what they're getting. It's really hard. A lot of these things are not easy to test for. So you have these very expensive supplements that, that bodybuilders take or people can take that have all these different things in them that are basically designed to basically for the most part to increase anabolic steroid production whatever they're not they're not really regulated because you're not really you're saying this will help and that's okay uh, there's actually a lot of work now that indicates you shouldn't even be taking vitamins unless you have some kind of a, of a physical problem that these things, uh, you know, and, and these things do pop out every once in a while. We had the ephedrine problem, remember, when all of a sudden they decided that they would regulate ephedrine because so many people were dying uh, from taking some, at first, ephedrine, and then there was a couple of plants that you could go and purchase the pills and uh, these 7-Elevens um, that would give you the ephedrine or, or something close to it. Um, so pretty much these things probably don't work that much. We also get into compounds that are very, very important. Uh, rubber, 
and uh, Gouda, which is very similar to that. And if we look at these here again, here's one that is important, carotenoids. And if we look at rubber, we just have basically this long chain of uh, polymer of, of, of double uh, bond carbons. And if you've seen where, how rubber is produced, uh, it's uh, produced in these very, it's, I, I didn't, I should have put a picture in here, there's really these very small latex particles, uh, produce why it's called latissifers. And then in this case, this is produced from a shrub. Uh, we'll finish up with one of the most famous one. I did look at these today. Uh, sometimes this is classified as a terpene, some not, and that's cannabinoid. Uh, I put this in, I was looking today, I was actually looking at the uh, uh, laws. We, I've been told several times now that to grow marijuana in Colorado, you have to have a plant science degree. And I've been told that by people that have come here to get a plant science degree. And I thought this was pretty neat that Department of Revenue Marijuana Enforcement Division for Retail Marijuana in, Cal in Colorado. Uh, when I took plant physiology, our book had three or four chapters in it on secondary metabolites, drugs. No plant physiology book out there now has anything about these things in it. Uh, when I came here, before I came here, uh, there was um, a big fight going on because there was a good chance that marijuana was going to be legalized. So the fight was whether or not marijuana is a horticultural or agronomic crop uh, because it was going to be pumping a lot of money into one of those two departments. And do you guys know what an agronomic versus horticultural crop is? Have you had all those definitions? Turf grass, oh, the, the, the definition goes back to the turn of the last century and it, it's not true anymore. But an agronomic crop is low input. Uh, so at the turn of the last century, you wouldn't plant a thousand acres of onions. A horticultural crop was a high value, low, high input, you know, you do a lot for a horticultural crop. Uh, you put a lot, of, you, 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 a lot of fertilizer inputs, a lot of different inputs in it. That doesn't really hold up anymore. So there was a big fight over whether or not, or it would, would marijuana be an agronomic crop because you'd be growing a lot of it and it also can be used for other things or would it be a horticultural crop? It turned out it didn't uh, pan out. Last thing, when I was a graduate student, anybody ever heard of kudzu? Uh, my entire lab was working on kudzu, and kudzu was is still growing over everything. And kudzu actually, you can almost watch it grow. It actually grows centimeters a day. And one of the guys that worked in my lab, who's now a doctor, um, was working on gibberellic acid in kudzu. And this was way before antibodies, so the only way you could purify gibberellic acid was you had to, you had to isolate a lot of, of kudzu. So he had just like these, goodness, eight liter beakers in a cold room, and he had maybe a hundred of them in the cold room, and you'd put the kudzu in there, grind it up, let it soak, except it wasn't kudzu. He was actually isolating THC from about a male of a marijuana. Um, I mean, it's just green, and you know, no one knew anything. And I came into the lab late one Sunday night, and he was in the lab, and with two guys that were not happy to see me there. And he had purified the THC, and it, I mean, he just, our advisor had left, so we could order anything we wanted. So he ordered all the chemicals, and we had a lyophilizer, so he purified this, you know, massive amount of of THC. Showed up the next day in a Porsche. It was a used one and put, him, put himself through medical school. So, you know, it was pretty an interesting experiment for him anyway. Um, now we'll talk to another group called glycosides. These are an entire class of compounds that are all sorts of different ones. Uh, probably the most, the ones you've probably heard about are the cardiac glycosides. 
are the glycosides that actually have cyanogen in them, uh, cyanide in them. And uh, this is one of the first, digitalis is one of the first drugs that was ever used uh, to control heart rate. And uh, it's not used much anymore. And this also, of course, if it can be used to control heart rate, it can also be used to stop the heart. So a lot of these things are not very good to have. Uh, what digitalis does actually is it, it actually uh, operates at the level of the ATPase pumps. And again, it can be used therapeutically in the right amount. And also, it, will, uh, it can be used stored. Most of these things, you know, poor, of course, other insects or other animals have evolved to use them. And they're actually fairly, ooh, that one didn't, fairly, uh, some of them are fairly simple. Here's this oleandrin. Anybody, you know, oleandrin, anybody know where you find oleandrin? Oleander. Anybody ever heard about all the Boy Scouts dying because they, you know, you know what ole oleander looks like? It's extremely straight. So you uh, put your hot dogs on the oleander and you cook them and they eat them and die. And of course, that never happened. Uh, you you can die by eating these things, but you're not going to get enough from a a stick to roast a wiener on to even make you sick. Um, but, you know, people have been killed by these. A lot of people have been, you know, used these things to kill their, usually their spouse. Uh, they are pretty toxic. A class one that, that's fairly interesting are the cyanogenic glycosides. So what has evolved is this mechanism of attaching a cyanide to a carbohydrate and storing it in the vacuole where it's not going to do any harm. But if something munches on it, munches on the cell, breaks the vacuole, uh, it can release the, the carbohydrate and then also then release the cyanide. And, of course, that's usually not good for whatever's eating on it. And the beauty is that it's only going to have the cyanide right at that point of release. And there are a good number of plants that have these glycosides in them. So for cassava has it, and um, you know that cassava must be, you must cook it. Uh, it's also found in seeds. I think I told you last time I was telling you about the turn of the last century where you could get a weight loss compound that was a very low level of cyanide. And so people have actually apparently killed themselves by eating apple seeds. Uh, I don't know. I've been told that. I've looked. It's not in scopes or anything. It's some kind of a... Uh-oh. Okay, I'm going to have to do this again. I might have to stop it and restart it. Another class are the uh, phenylpropanoids that arise from the aromatic amino acids. Phenylpropanoids become some of the more complex ma uh, molecules we find in plants. Uh, these, the bases of these are lignans and tannins and then flavonoids. Lignans, we're still not absolutely sure what the structure of lignin is. That's a big area because if we can modify lignin, then we can modify the quality of wood. Uh, so we can maybe more easily change the kind of wood. They come off of the shikimic acid pathway. It's a pretty complex pathway. And 
you can end up with a lot of different molecules here. Um, cumarins you may have heard of. And derivatives include aflatoxin, which is extremely uh, deadly. And um, it also produces, like I said, lignin, which we, we, you remember. And both, most of these things come from these very basic structures, where you have basically this phenol with some carbon added. produces, And then these become the more complex structures. You now remember flavonoids. We talked about them a bit before. Flavonoids are usually the color in plants. And uh, flavonoids right now are probably the number one hyped plant product in terms of health. There are numerous studies on flavonoids being antioxidants. What's an antioxidant? What does an antioxidant do? Get rid of free radicals. It 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 and it's usually assayed by putting the compound in a test tube with free radicals or with an oxidant and determining if it stops oxidation. And then that's it. And then most papers are done, and that's, the, that's how they do it. Now, it's easy to say something's an antioxidant in a test tube, but it's much harder to say that that's going to actually work in your body because it's going to have to go into your body, not only be absorbed and not broken down, uh, by, uh, or not to be absorbed and then not broken down in your stomach and then be absorbed through the stomach lining or wherever or into the intestine or whatever to get to where it works. So it's a lot harder to say that uh, something is an antioxidant and then actually think that it does something in humans. This usually involves um, a lot of work on population genetics. If we look at the, the stuff that had the most, uh, blackberry has, I think still has, there's something, uh, acai, what is yeah, that? Acai. acai has more than blackberry, has more uh, of the flavonoids. Any of you know Dr. Steve Talcott in food? You know, he and uh, Sipowitz actually have a, a acai wine on the market now. Uh, I've got Okay. Acai? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, he's he's actually got a a uh, patent on how to extract it. But there there are these rich foods. Uh, grapes, of course, are up there. Uh, another interesting thing, and I always like to include this. This is from an old book. It's that they are also not only used as colorants, but it's interesting to see what an insect sees versus what we see. So if they change the vision to see what an insect sees, basically you see this bullseye in the middle of the plant that the insect can actually uh, aim for. Now, um, they also produce tannins, and there are uh, condensed tannins, and there's, there's different kinds of tannins, and uh, they're used, of course, by us, to tan leather, and tannins, you know, I probably mentioned tannins are important for wine flavor. Uh, let me go back up here just for a second, though. Talk about these and what data actually can we say that there's some evidence that it works. And one thing that you've probably heard of is that red wine uh, is really good in terms of cardiac disease. And I think one of the first things I showed you was that curve where the more wine you, or the more alcohol you drink, I guess. But um, there's a thing called the French paradox where in France they eat an incredible amount of, of fat. They smoke. They do not exercise even as much as we do. And they have a very low rate of, cardi uh, of heart disease. 
And so they've done a lot of studies that include population studies that indicate that red wine is probably very, is, is very good in terms of lowering your, your chance of heart disease. And that's, that's been taken all the way to population studies. So it's not just something in a test tube. It's something they've done on populations. Uh, usually, and there's three or four things that have actually been extended all the way to the point of where they're believable. Vitamin C, vitamin E, uh, a couple of other things have been taken to the point of not just in tests with humans, but at the level of populations to indicate that, that the use of these things are fairly good. We're never going to, one thing you're never going to see, of course, is uh, the government recommend that you drink a glass of red wine every night. That's just not going to happen because of politics. So the other class we're going to talk about, of course, are the ones that are famous or infamous, the alkaloids. Um, here's a couple of just pictures I put in, there's a lot of these where, uh, you know, Coca-Cola famously used to have supposedly, co not cocaine, but the leaves in it, the original. So originally Coca-Cola was a real pick-me-up when it was first produced. When was it first produced? 18, 1880, something like that. Um, I love this one. This is three products that Bayer Chemical put on the market, aspirin, heroin, and uh, Lidotol. Uh, they took uh, aspirin off the market because nobody bought it. Because it, it was a pain relief that didn't work nearly as well as heroin did. <laughs> um, so only later did they actually reintroduce aspirin on the market. Um, And I want to put the Schedule One up because these things are starting to change a bit. Schedule One drugs, as you probably know, are drugs that have absolutely no drug benefit. And the reason why I put this up because there's been a lot of change when it's come to cannabis. So these are all drugs that have no known medical benefits, even though uh, LSD used to be used a lot in psychotherapy. And with the change in the laws, uh, we changed what drugs are. So if we go back, and I just want to say some of these drugs, so cannabis is probably moving down from being a Schedule One drug. Schedule Two drugs, high potential for abuse, but it may be okay for some very, uh, very limited uses. So methadone is used uh, for, uh, for people that have drug addiction. It's hard to get a hold of it. Ritalin is one of these. Schedule three drugs, some potential, and then schedule four are ones that usually you still have to have a prescription for, but um, they do have some use. And the point is that a lot of these moving around are more political than they are based on, in fact, they're almost all political, not really based on what they do. Alkaloids, usually soluble in water. Um, they can be very simple or they can be heterocyclic. Colchicine, anybody know what colchicine does? Colchicine, uh, colchicine, will double the chromosome number in plants. So it used to be used more, more by breeders. Uh, the notion was if you had double the chromosome number, then maybe the plant would be twice as big or the fruit would be twice as big or whatever. Uh, doesn't, it's, it's useful, it's, but it's been replaced by other uh, chemicals. You've probably heard of everything here, morphine, uh, mescaline, hemlock, um, these all have alkaloids in them. If you look at these, they they're, are very similar. So codeine and morphine, and then of course heroin is made, so it's just add some substitutions on there. They're synthesized from amino acids. Here's another couple of class, nicotine and caffeine, caffeic acid, they're derived from other chemicals, so they're not all just from organic acids. 
ethene and uh, nicotine, again, fairly simple molecules. And uh, you may have heard of this. These chemicals actually uh, are fairly, fairly bad and uh, can poison livestock. Atropine is still used, I think, a bit. I don't think scopamine is. And then we get into some very dangerous things. The nightshade family have alkaloids. May negatively affect human health. Oh, yeah. And um, they also have been shown, and all these things have also been shown to be anti-cancer. And in fact, there are a lot of compounds that have, that depends on the concentration. Um, I tried to look this up. There's, I, can, I don't know the, there's a compound in, uh, that's used a lot for burn patients. What is the plant? Uh, aloe vera, yeah. Well, it, it's, it's, um, it's very good, and, and I can't find the name of the compound that's in the plant, but the compound that actually is really, really good for burn patients is a very strong carcinogen. So I was, in, I, was on, I was on vacation, and I just happened to be at the same, at the hotel where they were having the national aloe vera meetings. And I just, so I went down and said, why don't you guys just purify this compound? Well, we can't. If we purify the compound, then we can't use it because it's a carcinogen. So as long as they purify the aloe vera as aloe vera, then they can use it. And there's a lot of things out there that at some concentration is a carcinogen, and at higher or lower concentrations, it's not. It depends on the compound. Why are they there? They weren't there to make people high. Alkaloids are there, of course, like most of these things, uh, to deter uh, deter something from eating it. Uh, and they're also antimicrobial. Usually, though, this is something that we see. This may not be as much in a plant. And I just wanted to finish up with this. I thought, since we're getting in this area where things are becoming uh, more legal than they used to be, this was a pretty interesting curve of uh, active dose, lethal dose. And so the higher up the chain, here, the higher up the graph, the more dangerous we have. So we have heroin, which of course is really bad, morphine, cocaine, alcohol is over here, ephedra, which I'm surprised isn't even higher. And so the things that are up here are the things that are uh, both active versus lethal and dependent. So, you know, heroin you become incredibly addicted to it. And I just noticed that I don't see uh, some of the other things on here. And so, uh, again, this is actually from a paper, so this isn't something I got off of a marijuana website. But just show you some, uh, just the ranking of things as active versus lethal versus where you become dependent upon it. Okay? Questions? That's a very brief overview of about two or three courses now. Um, secondary, secondary plant products are becoming extremely important. Uh, right now, it's almost all hype. You know, a very few things you can actually say are, are going to actually improve your chance. You know, red wine, since I teach winemaking, I like that. It's one of the few things that seems to be something that will lower your chance of uh, cardiac disease. Okay, questions? Okay, see you next time then.